Good afternoon and good morning. Uh, my name is Helen Beale. I'm here today from Range 4, so welcome to today's Range 4 webcast. Um, for those of you that don't know Range 4, we are DevOps Evolution Specialists. Um, today I'm, been de I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague from de our partner, Dynatrace, Martin Bailey. So I wanted to say hello to the team today. Hello to the team today. Thank you very much. And today Martin and I are going to be talking about um, digital performance management and how it relates to DevOps cultures. So um, we have a short agenda, trying to keep it short and sweet. So we've got a 30 minute schedule for today. So we're going to hit three things. So first of all, we're going to have a closer look at what DevOps culture actually looks like. So what are we aiming for? What, what is the ideal utopic state um, of a culture in the DevOps world? Then we're going to have a look at how DPM works, how digital performance management works, and then we're going to look at the relationship between these two things. So we're going to try and answer how and why DPM influences DevOps cultures. So I do like to start quite often with this funny little cartoon. Um, what we're really saying here is that there's a lot of buzz and a lot of talk around things like analytics and DevOps, um, and Dilbert always manages to take the mickey out of things very well. Um, but none of these are magic bullets, um, and lots of the things actually do need to work in combination. So DevOps gives us lots of promises, and we'll look at some of those promises in a moment in terms of some descriptors, if you like, of what a good DevOps culture looks like. And then we'll um, explore actually the kind of things that can help you get there. And particularly, we're going to look at um, some analytics today that can help you get to this, these lovely places. So what does a DevOps culture look like? Um, we do a lot of lunch and learns for our clients when they're trying to evangelize about DevOps. DevOps um, isn't one person's job. It isn't even a team's job. It's a bit of an anti-pattern having a DevOps team. Um, what we really need to do is proliferate DevOps thinking and principles across whole organizations. And that takes some work. And actually, lunch and learn is a, a good starting place for a lot of organizations. It's also for larger enterprises. It's a good um, opportunity to start building the community because the likelihood is you've got multiple folks within the business already that are trying to do various DevOps type things and bringing them together and learning from each other's experiences and proliferating best practices is really useful. So we do a lot of lunch and learns um, and one of the things that we do in a lunch and learn is we ask um, questions using a live poll feature um, and one of the questions that we ask is what uh, DevOps culture looks like and it's always really interesting getting different word clouds um, and people's thoughts from the audience so I picked a few of the words that have come up um, in these sessions and, and from various um, work and observations we've had in the field so I thought we'd have a look at a few of them in detail so um, one of them is frictionless or I often like to say friction free as well so this idea that we haven't got loads of handoffs we haven't got um, barriers between silos, we haven't got walls that things are being thrown over, we haven't got conflict um, between teams or people or departments that are trying to work on essentially the same value stream. So we're trying to remove this friction um, is one of the things we're doing in DevOps. So we aspire to have a frictionless, seamless culture where things move very fast. We also want to be very blame free. So we want to try and get away from things like uh, war rooms and post-mortems, which are two of my least favourite IT words. I wrote a blog a couple of years ago um, called Dirty Language, and it's a bit of clickbait, but it was trying to say there's lots of these words that have become part of our standardised vocabulary in IT, but are actually not great if you think about what they're describing. So, um, you know, if there's an outage, we don't really want to be spending hours, days, maybe even, um, pointing fingers at the DBA or the developer and saying it's your fault and, and having big arguments about um, whose fault it is. And then even worse than that, once we've discovered whose fault it was, we still don't, we don't really want to dwell on that. We want to just understand what the problem is and we want to then learn from the problem and try our best not to make it again. So this blame-free environment, and this is quite closely linked to this fearless environment that we're trying to generate in DevOps. So a lot of companies have had problems that have caused um, big business problems or big system outages um, that then lead to fear happening. And this is something we need to get away from um, in DevOps. So we want people to be much more innovative. And we'll come back to that kind of innovative question um, in a moment. Collaborative, of course we do. The S in CALMS is all about sharing. So we really want people to be able to communicate around um, what they're trying to do and be able to work on problems together. We want to remove these barriers to people working on a, a similar, on the same job. 
This word came up the other day um, in a customer meeting, um, this idea of harmony in the way that we work. So we all know what our jobs are. We're like a finely tuned orchestra um, playing a, a melody together um, and we're all perfectly in time and we know what our role is and we know when we're coming in and we're going out and we um, are perfectly in tune as individuals and as a team. So we want to create lots of harmony. Um, accountability is one that surprises people often when we come up with this and I think what we're really saying is about having shared accountability and I think this word is increasingly popular when we're talking about DevOps cultures for a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them is that um, in the early days of DevOps and, and Agile in particular, um, what a lot of people kind of thought was thinking about things about um, valuing working software over documentation, for example, being one of the things that's described in the Agile Manifesto. And there was an element of a kind of cowboyness sometimes to the way that people were developing and delivering software. I'm sure you've all seen the meme of the little girl with the house on fire behind her where she says, um, works fine in development, production's problem now. And we want to get away from that. So we want to retain our accountability, but have it shared. So um, we want people to have responsibility for the work that they do and what they're delivering to their customers. Um, and then the final adjective that I wanted to put in here was this idea of experimentation. So um, I mentioned the blame-free environment earlier. I mentioned wanting to get away from environments where there was lots of fear um, and actually get into the point where people are able to innovate. And I often use the phrase dancing around the edge of failure and see how people respond to that because some people think it's a positive thing, some people feel um, it's a very negative thing. In DevOps, we actually think it's quite a positive thing because failure is good in the respect that it proves that we're innovating. And in fact, um, some of our customers, notably Lego, have internal awards that they um, give to the kind of worst performing project and it's a recognition that people are trying new things and they're trying to be very creative about what they're delivering. So in DevOps we like to experiment, we like to be fearless about it, um, we're not afraid of failing but we've also built environments where we can fail fast, fail smart, fail safe. I'm sure many of you have heard those terms before um, and hopefully these are some of the areas in which we can um, look at how DPM and APM solutions can help. But just to finish this little section off, I just wanted to bring all of those kind of adjectives together under the banner of the three ways. So if you've read the Phoenix Project, you'll be familiar with the three ways, the principles that underpin DevOps. So when I talked about frictionless, friction-free culture, this is really about the first way. So it's about increasing flow. So increasing the value stream, pace of the value stream from left to right, so that pace of ideation to realization. And we'll come back to that uh, later on in the presentation. Um, then we've got the second way. So the second way is about amplifying feedback loops. So it's that ability to collaborate well. It's about hearing from your customer and your colleagues about what's going well and what's needed next and what the priority is. And then the third way is really where I was just sat a moment ago. So it's about experimentation and learning. So it's about being able to continuously improve the way that we approach things. So that's a bit about what we're looking for when we're looking for a uh, highly functional, highly performant DevOps culture. Let's now have a closer look at digital performance management. So Martin, first of all, could you tell me a little bit more about the term digital performance management and how it relates to application performance management? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Helen. So yes, uh, digital performance management uh, is the sort of next generation of application performance management or application performance monitoring tools. Uh, some use different terminology, but it's the, the, the next generation uh, of tools and the way that we work these days is a lot different uh, to, to how uh, traditionally siloed or infrastructure type application monitoring tools uh, have worked in the past. So it's quite common these days to hear, for example, digital performance managers or digital officers in companies. Uh, so we relate uh, the digital side actually uh, to the application. We relate how the application of the performance of the system relates to the digital side. So it's not just purely things like you know CPU or memory or what's the response time, but it's how does it affect what are my customers doing? Are they able to buy things? That sort of thing. So it's much more about the digital side. 
Um, if you could move on, Helen. Actually, I was just going to ask you another question quickly. Would you mind just giving us a quick background to Dynatrace and more recently kind of the movement that you've made from um, one product line to the, the Dynatrace um, managed or SaaS solutions that I'd like to focus in on in a bit? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Dynatrace, uh, some of you may know, was formed from what was CompuWare's APM division. Uh, the, they actually acquired a, a company called Dynatrace and later that became our, our new name uh, now. Uh, back in about 2011 we could see that APM was changing and how it was going to market was going to be different and obviously the technologies that, that were coming out. And so even a couple of years ago we allocated about 150 of our engineers to focus on what is the next generation of application performance management tools, hence DPM tools. And now we are our own DevOps company. We used to release software every two months, every two, uh, sorry, two releases a year. Now we're down to every two weeks we release uh, new major functionality. So in terms of uh, the new sort of technologies, let's think about very simply that the camera and how we used to take pictures. So the process that we'd go through, obviously here, we'd have to load some film in the, the camera. Uh, we'd get a certain number of features, so 24 shots on the film. We would take those pictures without seeing them. We would send them off to be developed. So you'd wait a few days. It would then come back. And as you can hopefully see on this picture, somebody uh, kindly photobombs it for us. And that leads to a lot of frustration. Maybe you had your finger over the lens cap or the sun was in the wrong position, etc. So the photos uh, you know, weren't always of the best quality. And obviously at that point, you then have to go out and take some more pictures. But if you're on holiday or abroad or wherever, it was very difficult to do that. I've always been very keen on butterflies and I spent huge amounts of film when I was a child photographing butterflies and they always just came out as plants. I always missed them. <laughs> I know that frustration. And that is part of the problem indeed. So if we now look, uh, I'm sure most of you now have your, your phones. Uh, this is uh, like my iPhone, where you can take a picture and right at that moment in time, you could still be uh, stood on the side of the lake in this example and you can say, well, actually, I'd like to change this or modify that slightly, or the, the sun is glaring here, or there's red eye there, or whatever the, the problem might be. You could make those changes at that point, and then you could solicit feedback by releasing those. Maybe you'll share them on Facebook, or you'll post them somewhere, but you would get immediate feedback. Hopefully, or most people will be complimentary, but if there were certain issues with the feedback, Maybe you would change the photo or retake the photo. You're there, you're still in the moment. You're able to make those changes at that time. It's still fresh in your mind uh, what you want to do, uh, what photos would be, be really nice. OK, yeah, people are liking that. Maybe I'll take some more of those uh, of the next lake or mountain or um, a portrait photograph. So it's very instantaneous. It's continual. That loop's continuous. Okay, yeah, people are liking that. My family and friends are liking it. Let's take some more. You don't have to wait, as in the previous slide, you don't have to wait until the the, uh, the, the film has been returned from the, the developers. So if we relate that to how Dynatrace can help you in the DevOps team. So we all act as engineers. Our DevOps teams all act as engineers. They have an investment in fixing code, identifying issues, knowing what's coming down in the pipeline, what time scales they're working to, how often they're going to release updates, what they're going to do, how it integrates with other tools. Uh, I'm sure you're all starting to experience the scalability issues where without automation, as humans, we would not be able to manage with the, the scale of the amount of changes, the amount of dependencies, everything that's happening. So we need tools to be able to help us go through this process faster. And then we need the information to allow us to make those decisions. So we can see, is something uh, having an impact to us? Is it uh, a degradation for us on the system? Is it causing us a problem? Is performance uh, an issue? Is it just actually stopped working? So it's not just about the the monitoring, it's knowing if there's an actual problem as well. And it's feeding that back. In this example, we have a, our own 
console and you can relate that maybe by geography, maybe by business line, maybe by application, maybe by product, however you wish to work, you can see what is affecting the business. So everybody has come together and this is part of the culture that we're talking about uh, on today's call uh, with Helen. So ourselves, Dynatrace as I mentioned, we've gone from two major releases a year to two every two weeks and we're releasing uh, minor, about 170 minor releases every day. So you've had to take quite a lot of friction out of the process in order to be able to do that, I guess. So you've been able to do that by creating visibility? Absolutely. That's probably our number one um, uh, tagline, if you like. It's all about visibility. And it's about sharing that information as well. It's not the case of developers throwing the code over the, the wall to the operations team and it's like, okay, we've got rid of that, now let's get on to something else. It's a case of you can see exactly at that point in time what impact uh, you've had. Maybe there's some tests that are now not running successfully. You can fix them while the code's fresh in your mind. You fix them and then it can get released and operations have a a better understanding of what you're doing because everybody's looking at the same information. So it's a consistent set of uh, languages that are being spoken across, you know, it's the same sort of information. You can share the information so that if there is a problem in operations, obviously we're trying to uh, stop problems from going into production, but if in, there is a problem, you can share that information with the development teams and, and hopefully fix the problem a lot quicker. Okay, so that's the Dynatrace story. Let's have a have a look at some other stories as well. So let's delve a little bit deeper. So we've talked about um, what a DevOps culture looks like in terms of being friction free. Um, you know, talked about may not have had it on the slide, but things like it being very high velocity um, and us being open and transparent and having visibility. Um, we talked about being blame free and fearless and experimental. So let's see um, how these two things, so how having digital performance management tools help us achieve those things um, in some customer environments. So we just saw how Dynatrace achieved um, increased collaboration and transparency and visibility, but let's have a look at some other businesses. So um, these slides are actually available to these people live on the webcast now um, as a handout. Um, they'll also be available in the feedback um, email um, from SlideShare. But let's have a, a look at Pandora, and I mentioned that because if you want to get to the full case study, um, you'll find that in the notes section of this slide. So um, this is a Dynatrace case study around Pandora, and Pandora, um, the jewelry makers, leverage um, APM to get IT business owners and third-party vendors all on the same page. So this is really about that collaboration element, getting all of the people involved in the whole value stream um, across the organisation. So um, here we have a, a screenshot, and... Martin, can you talk us through what we're seeing here, particularly um, this little red blob up here or this red person up here? Yes, not sure how clear that is on your screens, but yes. Uh, so somebody calls in to Pandora, they've got a problem, they're trying to buy something from their store, they give them their name. In this case, you might be able to see down the left-hand side, uh, it's an American called Randy, it's a very uh, apt name, and he has a little red box by him. That means that he is a frustrated users, user. So we use uh, industry defines uh, metrics for what is a, um, a satisfied user, a user that's tolerating problems, or a frustrated user. So in this case, we can see that he is a frustrated user. So straight away, we know where he's coming from, what he's using, what he's trying to do, and we've got information on every user. So in this case, there are a lot of uh, guys called Randy down the left-hand side. One is. Uh, um, tolerated users, so they're experiencing some degradation, but uh, this guy has a problem. So straight away it allows you to identify who has a problem, is it one person or, or a thousand, and drill down to see what his exact issue is. So one of the things we didn't really talk about when we talked about DevOps culture a moment ago is this concept of being very customer focused. So I think when organisations get quite bulky and they've been around for many years and things, it's quite easy for us to become quite um, introspective in large organisations. And one of the things we're really trying to do with DevOps is turn that on its head. We talk about um, outside in quite a lot. And if you do any work with Lean, you'll know that um, a big part of Lean is that, that focus on the customer. Like if you're doing a Kanban board, it's about pulling um, features through the board according to the customer's prioritisation. So this is an example of where 
Um, it, this is a tool that fuels that DevOps cultural change. So this allows you to very quickly understand what your customer is experiencing and at an individual end user level. And that is very hard to do. There aren't many tools out there, Martin, am I correct, that can actually do this at this um, specific individual end user level? That's right. We collect and are capable of collecting uh, the transactions for every user, every transaction, all of the time. And the way that our developers have written the product allows us to do that. That is a unique to us. But we have a mixture of technologies that allow us to see all users wherever they're coming from and whatever they're doing. And we can also run some what we call synthetic as well. So Pandora have a mixture of real user monitoring and synthetic. So synthetic is good for getting benchmarks, for checking availability, for comparing how one region or one store compares to another. And then the real users make sure that you're achieving the SLAs, that you can get down to here on the screen, we can see the root cause analysis. So you're able to drill down into it. So what Pandora liked was they got the full picture of everything, all users, third party interactions. If there was a third party, say, credit card validation or something on the website that was causing the, an issue, it's out of their control, but they can see that is the problem and get on to, the, to that third party to fix it. So this is about that blame-free concept we were talking about earlier. So this is about, um, because we can very quickly find out where the fault is, we don't have to spend hours pointing fingers at each other and wondering who did what, because we can see, we can diagnose really quickly. And it's, a, it's an important point because we do write lots of business cases on the diagnosis time being made much smaller for organisations, but we still have work to do in order to make sure that we're friction-free kind of across that whole value, sh value stream so that we can ensure that once diagnosis is made, that the actual resolution is achieved in a timely manner um, as well. So if we're talking about friction-free across the value stream, we'd be talking maybe about the support value stream of a particular process here um, and how quickly we can make quick we can make that. So let's take another um, customer example. So this is Nordstrom. Um, and this again about customer focus. Our customers expect the same level of service no matter where they shop with us. They're always looking for something new and better. So we always have to experiment and innovate. So this is getting back to the third way, um, you remember we had experimentation as our last attribute that we're looking for um, as an example today of DevOps cultures. So we're looking for organizations that experiment. So Nordstrom, um, this is from the Dynatrace case study. So Nordstrom make a direct correlation between what Dynatrace provides to them um, and um, their ability to deliver experimentation and learning. Um, Martin, do you have any comments you'd like to make on this slide? Uh, yes, well, as you can see there, they, they want to know about everything. We they have multi-channel, but it's a very complex environment. It changes all the time. They have hundreds of stores, and I think they're in 96 different countries. So, you know, it's a very complex uh, environment. And even getting applications out into that environment, their DevOps cycle, similar to Dynatrace, they actually reduce their testing cycles from two months down to two weeks. So straight away, they could get issues flagged in test and fix them, nip them in the bud before they actually went into to production. Uh, and that's one great example of how it helps the operations team by the developers having this automated culture that allows them to, to fix issues straight away. And it really does bridge that gap that we often see in traditional enterprises between developers and operations. So developers create the code, the changes get made, something goes into production, something breaks. Um, and then quite often we've got support teams scrambling all over the place trying to figure out what's wrong. But very quickly the development, development and operations team can either work together or do it themselves and identify very quickly um, in the code where that problem was and go through a very fast change loop um, to fix that. So when I talked about... Um, experimentation being a good thing earlier and failure being something that we embrace in DevOps and we don't run away from and having the ability to have um, systems that provide fail safe, fail smart, fail fast type capabilities. This is one of the attributes again of DPM. So it's that ability to say something's broken, let's figure out what it is really quickly and fix it really fast. And this is one of the reasons that DPM really supports what we're trying to do um, in DevOps as well as bringing those teams much closer together and allowing them to collaborate. In fact, we have one um, customer we're working with at the moment 
who's been looking at some of the, the newer tools from Dynatrace. And one of the things that they've said is actually in some respects, this single pane of glass or this um, this feedback loop almost goes away for them because the um, the new Dynatrace uh, SaaS and managed products are so easy for them to use that they've been having their business people um, actually identifying problems in their um, in their applications and not even having to involve IT. So it's kind of, um, and we'll look at value streams in a moment, but it's concertinering or squashing down um, that that time it takes from having a problem to fixing it um, to a smaller and smaller um, basis. Um, and again, this emphasis on accelerating innovation, so the ability to experiment, being able to be very confident about what you deploy. And again, this focus on the customer. Um, so once more, being able to put that customer first um, and drive innovation according to the feedback loops that we're receiving about what is needed. Um, and as GoPal summarizes it, performance is a joint responsibility between our test team, development team, the business, everyone works together, working together. So DevOps, you know, became this portmanteau of dev teams and ops teams working together. But most people recognize now the kind of div, dev biz test sec op, biz ops kind of, you know, people have been stringing more and more words together, recognizing that actually what we're doing here is optimizing the IT value stream of delivery. So we're getting um, features and innovation to our customers and our users faster and more painlessly than ever. So the final one we wanted to touch on, and um, th there is the video um, linked in the notes section. We just have this quote. So um, Whirlpool said, it was the teamwork between the development team, operations and the vendor um, that was something difficult to do without Dynatrace in place. So this emphasis, again, on this ability of APM and DPM tools um, to bring all of the people involved in the value stream together. Martin, do you have some more um, words you'd like to say about this story? Yes, I mean, this is very similar to our own uh, internal story about how Dynatrace became DevOps. And we see it as 80% culture and 20% tool. But of course, to achieve that, that 20% of the tool is, is very important to share the information, as we'll, we'll, we'll say here. It's without that information, the development team, operations team, throughout the testing, other third parties, other vendors that are involved as well, they don't get that visibility. Uh, we've spoken about you know the, the smoothness uh, of it sharing information between different groups so that single pane of truth if you like that visibility that this is how it actually is nobody says oh it's not because it's fact you know this is the real users we can drill down to the root cause we understand where the problem is and hence to fix it the mean time to resolution the MTTR uh, comes down because they're sharing the same information uh, operations can pass that information to development and everybody can can resolve the issue uh, more quickly. Thank you. So to summarize or bring us back to the three ways which we used at the end of the first section when we were talking about what DevOps culture looks like, um, we're looking for um, these three underpinning practices. So we're looking for a friction-free culture where people can um, work together, there's very little conflict, there's very little blame. Um, so the way that APM helps us do that is it allows us to fix things very quickly in pre-production. Um, it allows us to identify root causes very fast um, in order to increase that flow. And that's similar. It is a feedback loop, um, but it goes one step further, as I said earlier, in that some, sometimes it eliminates the need for the feedback loop because actually people can just figure it out for themselves and fix that thing, thing themselves. Um, and that being the second way about amplifying feedback loop, Loops. And the third way about experimentation and learning, as I said, um, APM very much supports an environment where you can um, dance around the edge of failure, you can fail fast, smart, um, you can fail safe because you have the systems to identify very quickly where the problem is and fix it very quickly. So as Martin just said, getting that MTTR right down. So just to summarize again, this concept of ideation to realizations, this is, is for us the ultimate DevOps metric. Um, so what we're trying to do is get this gap, so this spring that you can see here, we're trying to compress this as much as we can and reduce the time between you having an idea or your customer coming to you with a request for something that they'd really like to see um, and you delivering that. And I've got a pound here because what we're really trying to do is realize that value. We're trying to measure that value a lot of organizations we work with at the moment, the IT organizations are quite concerned with 
articulating their value back to the business and they're quite keen on being seen as a centre of innovation that's driving the whole business forward. So having the ability to measure at a real-time level what value your application is providing for you is really, really critical. And that's a real strength of Dynatrace in particular, isn't it, Martin? Yes, I was going to pick up on that. So in terms of digital performance management, IT is very important to the business. With the technologies that are available today, for example, because Dynatrace sees every user and what they're actually doing in those transactions, they can see that at a particular point, because maybe uh, there was a problem or a server went down or whatever it was, they could quantify it. We're able to say uh, you had the users had this much in their shopping baskets and never converted, they never checked out, for example. So it's very much a, a digital officer, a business type value that you're getting from IT. So obviously shortening the features and the functionality, the release cycles, making it a lot quicker to get that out to the market is one thing, but being able to understand the user's behavior and quantifying that to the business is also an important part of the digital performance management. Wonderful, wonderful summary. So what's next? Um, you can get a free trial. Martin, where do the guys go for a free trial? Yes, you can talk to Ranger 4 or you can go to Dynatrace and you just have a look on our website and uh, there's lots of free trial adverts on there. Uh, our new generation Dynatrace SaaS or managed uh, solution also has this artificial intelligence uh, level built on top so if you have a thousand users that are having problems, for example, it can analyze that 950 are having a problem because of that uh, credit card validation, but this 50 are having it because that database has an issue, etc. So it's helping you with all the dependencies that are on there. We've spoken about the, the scale and the complexity of the IT environments these days. We have this artificial intelligence engine that sits on top that gives you the the identification of the root cause and gives you the solution to it as well. So if you go to dynatrace.com and you'll see the free trials. And for the people that are on the webcast today, we'll put a link in your follow-up email. And so that's that's the end of our, it's brought us nicely to the, uh, the end of our 30 minutes. Actually, we're two minutes over, so thanks everybody for your time. We do have some time for any questions. I can't see any popping up in the question box at the moment. Uh, we'll just give people a couple of seconds. Does anybody have a question they'd like to ask Martin or I about Dynatrace or any of the user stories um, that we've had today or how it relates um, to DevOps cultures? Whilst we're waiting for some to come in, Helen, maybe I could just give some uh, statistics about us internally having used uh, or changed our culture to become a DevOps company. We now find 93% of our production bugs in development, the developers find those. We have about 340 stories per sprint. As I mentioned, we do about 170 deployments a day. Uh, we've got 450 uh, instances on Amazon. We do about 200 code commits a day, and we've done about 31,000, uh, or we do 31,000 unit and integration tests per hour on our software. Any questions, Helen? Um, no, none as yet. So I think we'll probably say that's all for today. Um, thanks, everybody, for your time. And we will follow up with the recording and the slide share and the link to the free trial. Uh, you know where we are if you've got any more questions. Um, so thank you, Martin, for your contribution today. And thank you, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thanks, and goodbye, everyone. Bye. Um, yeah, yeah. Goodbye, everyone. No